This is CBC Winnipeg News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. For months now, garbage has been piling up outside a condo building in Winnipeg's West End. A tenant tells CBC News garbage bins there were removed last summer and never replaced. As CBC's Cameron McLean reports, one city councillor says this isn't the only building facing problems. Okay, well, this isn't where it's supposed to be, but um, that's where <laughs> a lot of us are putting the garbage. Pauline Dussault says she's fed up with the trash outside her Maryland Street condo building. Oh, yay! Isn't this fun? Walking through the garbage. Behind the building, numerous recycling bins, some filled with trash, but no garbage bins. Dussault rents a unit here. She says she's complained to the company that manages her unit, as well as the city of Winnipeg. She says the city told her the board that manages her building switched to a private contractor. Without a way to properly dispose of their trash, Dussault says residents have resorted to tossing it on the ground. It kills me to do that. Like, I'm, I'm not a litter bug. Yeah. And I don't want to, but it's like, yeah. and like I said, what more am I supposed to do? CBC News contacted members of the condo board, but they declined to be interviewed. In a statement, the board says they've hired a private contractor for garbage removal as needed, but not for weekly pickups, and they haven't been by since spring. As you can see, after CBC News contacted the board, someone came and cleaned up the trash, but there are still no bins behind the property. As it turns out, there are no rules requiring multifamily buildings to have garbage bins. One city councillor hopes to change that. It was shocking. We have to figure out a plan in order to manage that. Like if the apartment building doesn't have a bin, there could be a fine associated with that um, to make sure that you know people are um, making sure that there's adequate garbage for their residents. Residents like Pauline Dussault, who just want somewhere to put their trash. Cameron McLean, CBC News, Winnipeg. Premier Heather Stephenson is putting a positive spin on the news many of her MLAs will not seek re-election. The CBC's Ian Phrase joins us now live in the newsroom. So Ian, what is the Premier saying? She's calling this a chance to rejuvenate the party. New PC candidates will bring new ideas. But before then, she's vowing to shake up her inner circle. She's promising a cabinet shuffle and looking to elevate some new voices. Because of the 36 MLAs who were in caucus a year ago, 11 of them are not seeking re-election this fall. Stephenson says she isn't worried. My message to Manitoba is that rejuvenation is a positive thing. You know, when people have come to, you know, the end of where they're, you know, their political lives, they're making those decisions for themselves. And it's a very exciting thing. You know, I wish them well and I, I, I love my colleagues. There's no question. But I'm super excited about what the future has in store for our province and our party. Three MLAs have yet to declare if they're running again. Shannon Martin in the Winnipeg riding of McPhillips, Brad McAlexey in Dauphin, and Rick Wolchuk in Swan River. Now, Ian, I know you ran into the province today, or the Premier, I should say, at an event where Travel Manitoba unveiled its new campaign for encouraging people to visit the province. Let's change gears now and, and take a look at that. How will the Crown Corporation be marketing Manitoba? With a new advertising campaign, Janet meant to play on emotion. Take a look. We all need travel, but we all need something a little different from the places we go. We need adventure. Travel Manitoba has a new slogan. It's called Canada's Heart is Calling. This is a refresh of the existing slogan, Canada's Heart Beats. The campaign is meant to tug at your heart. Travel Manitoba CEO Colin Ferguson says it was time for a change. Manitoba Canada's heartbeats gave us a foundation upon which to build and upon which to grow. And at the time, quite frankly, 10 years ago, travelers had very low expectations of Manitoba as a travel destination. And Canada's heartbeats changed that. This brand is, is digging a lot deeper. This is actually addressing what your heart can do, whether it's when your heart needs to race or when your heart needs wild or when your heart needs to sing. Or the ad campaign is aimed at neighboring provinces and states, as well as Toronto and California, given there are now direct flights from here to the Golden State. Janet. 
Thanks so much for this, Ian. That's our Ian Fraze reporting live from the newsroom tonight. A fire broke out at the Victoria Hospital this morning, injuring a patient and three staff members. We don't know how serious their injuries are, but we do know the fire was put out quickly. The WRHA says the fire broke out around 10.20 this morning on the hospital's sixth floor. It set off the sprinkler system, causing some flooding and electrical issues. Staff moved 21 patients to other areas of the hospital. The hospital suspended visitation for the rest of today Visitation will resume tomorrow. WRHA hasn't said what caused the fire. It is under investigation. A specialized and potentially life-saving treatment for certain cancers is coming to Manitoba. The province is spending millions of dollars to launch a type of T-cell therapy, which right now is only available out of province. As the CBC's Josh Crabb reports, Cancer Care expects the need for this type of treatment to grow. Some people living with leukemia and aggressive lymphoma will soon be able to access chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cell therapy without having to leave Manitoba. Winnipegger Shirley Mooney went to Toronto for two and a half months last year to get the treatment after getting diagnosed for the third time with lymphoma. I think that's wonderful. It is, uh, it's long overdue. There, it's, it's something that uh, patients need to have their family and their support group there. Here's how it works. A patient's cells are collected and then the modified cells are given back to them through an intravenous injection. Cancer Care Manitoba is preparing to launch it here this spring with $6.6 million in funding from the Manitoba government. It's an immunotherapy where uh, the patients uh, get a, a, their own uh, immune cells that have been modified to attack the cancer cells that are causing the problem. Manitoba Blood and Marrow Transplant Director Dr. David Schweitzer says people are then monitored by a clinical team to make sure there are no issues. Manitoba has been sending six to eight patients out of province each year for the treatment, but Cancer Care Manitoba CEO Dr. Sri Navaratnam says it'll be used more often in the years to come. The type of disease that this is going to become available, it's growing. We want to ensure that we are providing care here in Manitoba and building capacity right here in our province. A pediatric oncologist says the move will also benefit children with this leukemia. Is, so this is a huge announcement for us because this is actually going to give us a new therapeutic option uh, to treating uh, young children who have uh, otherwise a chemotherapy resistant disease. So far, the treatment seems to be working for Mooney. She's glad people who qualify for it won't have to travel as far to get it. It helps the family too because the family can be there to see you. Josh Crabb, CBC News, Winnipeg. Health Minister Audrey Gordon says having the program here will also help attract and retain technicians and researchers. The province says it could save an estimated $2.2 million a year in operational costs. Fans are just now starting to come into the Canada Life Centre in downtown Winnipeg for a big hockey game tonight. But it's not the Jets playing. The University of Manitoba Bisons are welcoming the Ukrainian national team for a special game. It's part of the Can't Stop Hockey Tour, which is raising money to train players from Ukraine and also to help with humanitarian efforts in the war-torn country. CBC's Emily Brass is at Canada Life Centre and she joins us now live. Hi, Emily. Hi, Janet. Yeah, the doors just opened a few minutes ago, so the crowd is just arriving. I saw a few families walking by with their popcorn, looking for their seats. A big crowd is expected tonight. Among them, many Ukrainian newcomers excited to cheer on their team. I've just learned that the Jets gave away 1,500 tickets, so there are going to be a big bunch of Ukrainian fans here tonight. Right now, I'm with one of the organizers, and he's no stranger to hockey fans, longtime sports announcer, Gord Miller. Hi, Gord. Hi, thanks for having me. So what can fans expect tonight? Well, I think what you're going to see is a really emotional night for the Ukrainian players who are on their way to the World University Games. And the whole idea of this tour was to give these players and this team a chance to play. They can't train at home. They couldn't play exhibition games. We brought them over here to play University of Saskatchewan, Calgary, Alberta, and now Manitoba tonight. The first three games have been very emotional. The players are excited to play in an NHL building. Uh, it's overwhelming for them in a lot of ways. What's it been like for them back in Ukraine trying to train and keep up their well, skills? Well, very difficult, obviously. And it's, it's obviously, you know, the other, you know, last week, a, a, an arena in, in the Donbass region was destroyed by a Russian missile strike. It was being used 
as a warehouse for humanitarian aid. So arenas haven't been operating with the power out. Um, and so it's been very difficult for them to train, to play. And this is what they love to do. For them to be invited to the World University Games is a big honor. They didn't think they'd be able to go. They didn't think they'd be able to, to take part. And now tomorrow they're leaving for Montreal onto Lake Placid, so that dream comes true as well. And why is it that important that they continue to hit the ice and play against other teams? Well, I think for them for them personally, it's what they love to do. And I think also, you know, the Ukrainian people, the Ukrainian government, Vladimir Zelensky has talked about the importance of Ukraine not disappearing from the national international stage. You know, we saw a Ukrainian singer win the Univision contest uh, in Europe, and uh, the Eurovision contest, sorry. And, and, and so I think that it's really important for for the Ukrainian people, for people to remember that they're still out there, that they're not, they're not taken off the world stage. And this is the fourth and final game yeah. of the Can't Stop Hockey Tour. How have the games been going so far? It's been unbelievable. In, in Saskatoon, in Calgary, in Edmonton, much smaller buildings, but really enthusiastic crowds. We've got Hoosley here tonight to sing the national anthem. I, it's just, it's such a different, it's such a different experience because it's not what we're used to in hockey where, you know, all the fans are cheering for one team. I think fans here will cheer for both teams, but in the end, they'll cheer for the game and they'll cheer for these young players who have endured a lot. I mean, a lot, some of them were in the army and got you know special passes to come and play here so i think that uh, it'll be a really special experience uh, the lower bowl is going to be packed and uh, it should be a lot of fun and of course they're also going to be helping raise money where yeah. are those funds going to go towards so it goes towards uh, the canada ukraine foundation which is a, a leading a provider of humanitarian aid to ukraine both here in canada for refugees who are settling and also in terms of uh, medical supplies clothing food to send into Ukraine and also to save Ukrainian hockey dream, which is trying to keep arenas open in Ukraine. For example, the main arena in Kyiv right now is being opened basically around the clock for public skating for children who need a place to go where they can just get away from all the day-to-day -day stresses of their lives and just have a nice day on the ice. Can't stop skating and you can't stop hockey. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gord. My pleasure. And the puck drops at 7. Back to you, Janet. Emily Brass reporting live tonight. Thank you, Emily. A memorial took place in Winnipeg yesterday to mark the third anniversary of the downing of flight PS752. About 100 people gathered inside the Canadian Museum for Human Rights to remember the 176 passengers killed. It's been three years since missiles fired by the Iranian military brought down this Ukrainian International Airlines flight. Eight Manitobans were on board that flight and were killed. Arian Arianpour is the president of the Iranian community of Manitoba. He says families are still waiting for justice. But he's hopeful recent protests in Iran will bring new freedoms to the country. Still, because no justice has been served, people are in a mourning stage. But as people chant on the streets in Iran, it's not time for mourning, it's time for fury. 55 Canadian citizens and 30 permanent residents lost their lives when that plane crashed. A Winnipeg teenager is looking forward to a safe trip of a lifetime, but he cannot make that journey without a little bit of help from his friends, some charitable people. CBC's Joanne Roberts explains. 15-year-old Eli Duchak has Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. His joints can dislocate easily. The genetic disorder affects his connective tissue. As I age, it's just going to get worse and worse. But it's not stopping him from dreaming big. I went to Canada Wonderland, which had one of the best roller coasters I've ever been on. Uh, the, and then I wanted to go to an even better amusement park. And then uh, apparently Tarragona has... Uh, one of the best in the world. That's right. Duchak wants to go to Spain to ride the roller coaster at Port Aventura World. His family needs a little help. Manitoba charity The Dream Factory stepped in to do what it does best, help make dreams come true. Michael Santaseri is the operations manager of Brickhouse Gym. He partnered with The Dream Factory, and together they held a grappling competition over the weekend. I wanted to work with somebody from the province, somebody where I knew where all the money was going and it was actually going to support somebody. With Santaseri achieving his goal of raising $10,000, Duchak's trip to Spain is a go. Yeah, knowing that it's, uh, I'm going to be part of a select few who get to uh, like explore the world at large. It's really quite easy. 
I was quite lucky that I get to do this. In addition to seeking thrills on roller coasters, Duchak says he's also looking forward to exploring the theme park's ancient ruins and slowing down to immerse himself in the culture of Spain. Joanne Roberts, CBC News, Winnipeg. Our weather specialist, Fiona Anglum, joins us now. Minus seven. Yeah. What a mild day we've had. And uh, it was a bit chillier over the weekend, it though, wasn't was it? It was chilly on the weekend. On Saturday, I went walking, and there was blowing snow, and it was cold. And, you know, do you know, Janet, do you know what national day it is today? No. National Static Shock Day. Oh, like static electricity, <laughs> the stuff that we're all dealing yeah. with. The balloon on the hair. And yes, the yeah. yeah. And when you touch your dog, and you're like, oh, we yeah. get a lot of that in January, yeah. usually because it's so dry. So dry, yes. And, well, it's going to stay dry here in Winnipeg. No snow coming uh, tonight, but maybe tomorrow. Let's look at our current conditions. Well, right now we're sitting at minus 7 degrees. Partly, mostly cloudy, lots of cloud out there. We're looking for a really light wind to stay with us throughout the evening tonight. We're going to be watching for a little bit of snow. I want to zoom in in this one area. So let's keep a real close eye right here. You're going to see a little bit of pink pink pop up once it resets. Did you see that? You see a little bit of pink? We've got some mixed precipitation there. So some freezing rain right into this zone here. That has me just a little bit nervous for commuters through that region. It's not a lot, but definitely put that on your radar if you're gonna be moving through that zone. Look at this blanket of, of cloud that we have through here. This darker white, we have a load of snow coming to the north, but we're gonna watch over here. A little bit of snow is gonna start making its way towards us into southern Manitoba. And we could even see it touching into Winnipeg but it's really not going to be producing a whole lot of snow towards us. So we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, getting the shovels out or anything. But here, I'm just going to run the models for you. You can see that the blue comes through, but we don't register any numbers into Winnipeg and the surrounding area. So we don't really have too much snow, except for maybe in Portage, where we might get to one centimeter. Okay, tonight at midnight, we're going to start seeing that fog rolling in once again, looking for minus eight as our high at around midnight, light wind. Lots of cloud. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of sunshine coming towards us for the next nine days. Mostly cloudy and a bit of fog and minus nine when we get going tomorrow morning. Again, that light wind. Minus eight by lunchtime. And we're pretty much going to stick around there. Might warm up to around minus six, seven, but not really any warmer than that. Minus seven for Wednesday. Minus ten for Thursday. Minus eight for Friday. This is the pattern we're going to be seeing for Winnipeg really for the next week and beyond. After that, we start seeing our temperatures warming just a little bit, and in the very long range, which I'm not gonna worry about yet, we do have a bit of snow coming towards us, but only one hour of sunshine coming towards us each day. And with that fog, that might mean that again tomorrow, we could see some more rime frost in our future. And you know, I have to thank Barb from Dougald for sending in this beautiful sunset. Thank you so much, Fiona. The Winnipeg Sports Car Club held its first racing event of the 2023 season yesterday. Drivers met at Bosser's Co-op Community Complex racetrack. They competed in two different events, ice racing and ice cross or drifting. Now, if you're one of those drivers who actually likes the feeling when you kind of lose a bit of control in your car, fishtails, the back end drifts, this may be the club for you. Well, today is our first season uh, racing event of the year for 2023. It's our ice racing and ice drifting, what we call our ice cross uh, race. You know, it just passes the winter by so fast. I, I am a winter person, I enjoy winter, and there's no place I'd rather be than out on the ice. Uh, the ice racing uh, is side-by-side -side caged race cars like the one behind me. A uh, fair bit of safety equipment. Uh, you need a racing license, comp com a competition racing license, uh, to compete in that uh, in that group. And uh, it's traditional racing, where you're racing side by side, first one to the finish line wins. This is club racing, and it's just uh, the com camaraderie amongst all the racers. We're basically out here to have fun. Yeah, we're competitive, but. Uh, You'll see in the pits, as soon as somebody comes in with a broken car, everybody's rushing over to help him get his car back on the track so we can race. With the studded tires, you actually do have a fair bit of grip. These are very aggressive studded tires we have. Um, 
But having said that, because you have so much grip, you're maintaining the speed so much, you're chucking it into the corner pretty aggressively, which is throwing the car sideways. And then you're controlling it with your thro with the throttle more than anything than the steering. Uh, this, uh, when you're sliding on ice, you, you find that you're, you're steering more with a throttle and tapping the brake and, and things like that. Uh, when you're out in the rubber tires, it takes a whole different skill level to be drifting on it. You'll see some of these guys out in these all-wheel drive cars showing incredible car control of how they're uh, controlling, controlling it while being out of control. If you want to come out and do some uh, ice lapping in your streetcar, there is an IceX division where you can do, it's not racing, but you can get out on the track and do some sliding. And it's a very inexpensive race to, uh, form of racing to get into. Like I've got maybe $2,500 into this car. So you can be competitive for a reasonable amount of money. Ice drifting, or the ice cross we call it, is uh, more fun than co competition. Most people when they get out on ice and the car slides sideways a little bit, they get unnervy. When you're six inches away from another car at, at about 80 miles an hour sideways, that's got to get the, pump, the heart pumping. I love that. Well, the Winnipeg Sports Car Club, if you want more information. An attack on government buildings in Brazil's capital had police rounding up suspects. Roughly 1,500 people have already been detained. A Winnipegger who's from Brazil brings us reaction after the break. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News. So you've taken up running. 
Apple Watch is taking up a few new things as well. First, it tracked your distance. Now, it tracks your stride length. It knows a breaststroke from a backstroke and checks for temperature changes to estimate when you've ovulated. When you're dreaming, it's measuring your REM sleep down to the minute. And it can detect a serious car crash and call for help. So yeah, a few new things. Brazil's justice minister says roughly 1,500 people have now been detained in connection with a violent attack in the capital of Brazil yesterday. In an assault that may remind you of the one we saw in the U.S. Capitol two years ago, supporters of Brazil's ex-president stormed Congress, the Supreme Court, and the presidential palace, and then they trashed the buildings. The protesters want the military to either restore Jair Bolsonaro to power or oust newly inaugurated leftist president Lula da Silva. President Lula met with his cabinet today and vowed to protect democracy and round up everyone who was involved in the attack, including dismantling the protesters' camp. The former president, meantime, is being blamed for the riot. Bolsonaro, who you see in Florida, has not publicly conceded defeat. He's made unsubstantiated claims that Brazil's election was rigged. This afternoon, I spoke with the president of the Brazilian Association in Winnipeg to hear what Brazilian Manitobans think of the unrest. Maggie DeMarkey, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. When you see the unrest happening in Brazil right now, what goes through your mind? Sadness. I, I, I feel a little shame of seeing those things on TV or on the news. How do you mean shame? Uh, we are not that kind of people. Brazilian people are normally uh, more respectful, I think, and uh, nicer people. And we never saw something like that, not ever. And we had so many problems before, always. We always had problems. We always had some kind of corruption in the government. But we never have seen so badly portrayed everywhere, like the way we saw in these couple of days. Why do you think it's happening now? A few people who are anarchists are trying to make a scene and call attention to, to what they believe. I do not believe this movement represents the voters of Bolsonaro at all. Um, I, I, I know many people who have been protesters, protesting peacefully. Uh, they are against the new government. Uh, so. I don't think this anarchy represents them. It does not represent really any serious group of people. When you speak with friends or family who are still in Brazil, what do they tell you? How are they feeling? Most people, I hear sadness. I, I hear a lot of sadness. I don't see anybody uh, happy with what is happening. And, and I also started hearing some people really concerned uh, with what that will make uh, economically for the country. Probably money uh, from, from other countries will run away, investors will run away from Brazil. Like, this doesn't uh, uh, do any good for Brazil at all. How divisive are politics right now in Brazil? I'm, I'm sorry? How divisive? How divisive are politics? You know, is it hard for people to get along if they have different opinions? Same as before the election, 50-50. It's like 50% of the population, not, not 50, the, not 50 because there is a big percentage of the population that just withdraw and do not vote whatsoever. They would just uh, vote for no one. But the 50% of the people who are engaged are, are in opponent sides. So it's here in Manitoba, what what do you think Manitobans of Brazilian descent, people who have family and friends uh, in Brazil, would like to see happen? They would like to see peace. They would like to see democracy working, right? The, the, there was an election 
and 50% of the votes plus one won, right? So the majority got this government. You like it or not, we are supposed to accept that, right? Until next election. And most people believe that. Most people, even here in Manitoba, who are watching what's happening in Brazil, that's what I hear them say, they think. Uh, of course, there are a group of people who voice this better, saying they would like the government to do more to prevent this, but being transparent, right? And resolving what people are, are asking. They want to be certain that the election was not manipulated. I don't know if that is possible, right? You believe in the system or you don't. But uh, some people believe the government should do more to prevent these things, right? Believe, do more to prevent people to get to this extreme. Maggie Demarkey, president of the Brazilian Association in Winnipeg, thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Mexico for the North American Leaders Summit with President Andres Manuel López Obrador and U.S. President Joe Biden. There's speculation Canada and the United States may be set to announce a resolution to a lingering issue, one that has had the U.S. refusing to open Nexus card processing centers in Canada. Supply chains will also be a key issue for discussions. The three leaders are looking for ways to strengthen ties for goods such as electric vehicles and critical minerals. All of them want to lessen their reliance on China in those areas. Iran executed two more people over the weekend, people who were arrested while taking part in protests that have gripped the country since last fall. And these executions have triggered an outpouring of international condemnation. Canada has imposed new sanctions targeting what it calls Iranian propaganda. Other governments, including Britain, Germany, the U.S. and the E.U., are taking diplomatic action. <laughs> Two men were hanged on Saturday. A video on social media purports to show demonstrators outside the prison where the two men, two other men rather, are set to be hanged. At least three more people have been sentenced to death for the killing of a paramilitary militia member during anti-government protests. Two other men were executed earlier. Iran has been rocked by demonstrations and violence since a 22-year-old woman died while she was in the custody of Iran's so-called morality police back in September. She was being held for violating the Islamic Republic's strict dress code. She was letting her hair show. Ukrainian forces say they're weathering a powerful Russian assault on the eastern Donbass region. They say the attacks are coming in waves. Several towns are under bombardment. The CBC's Briar Stewart takes a look at some of the damage. A market 80 kilometers southeast of Kharkiv is the latest site of a Russian missile attack. At least two women were killed four were injured, including a 10-year-old girl. Now, images from the scene, you can see the scale of the destruction. There are a number of small market stalls that have been torn apart by the blast and by the explosion. And this was the latest uh, attack today, but it was the strategic city of Kramatorsk that was hit a number of times over the weekend, early Sunday morning, in fact. And officials with Russia's Ministry of Defense say that they were targeting a dormitory where Ukrainian soldiers were staying. They said that two dormitories were hit and that 600 soldiers were killed. But the facts on the ground in Ukraine tell a much different story. Uh, reporters who have visited the scene have found that the dormitories, which were said to be decimated, are very much intact and that there are large craters uh, where the strikes hit, but they're on the ground. They said that there's no sign that anybody had been killed or even hurt. And that's what Ukraine says. Ukraine says they did not lose any soldiers in Kramatorsk. And so you have the Russian Defense Ministry trying to, to push this narrative about all of these deaths. And they're really trying to uh, sell it as retribution for an attack that happened on New Year's uh, on their soldiers in the community of Makivka. In that attack, at least 89 Russian soldiers were killed. And I say at least because that's the number that Russia has confirmed 
Well, Ukraine uh, says that the, the true death toll is actually much higher in the hundreds. And so Russia has been trying to uh, say what they did in Kramatorsk was payback and that they successfully killed 600 soldiers. But that version really contradicts uh, what Ukraine and reporters are, are saying on the ground. Today, the Kremlin was asked about the discrepancy. And all that Kremlin officials would say is that they have full confidence in the information they're getting from the Ministry of Defence. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Canada's Liberal government is replacing our current fighter jet fleet with 88 F-35 aircraft. Now, F-35s are the fighter jets that Canada has previously opposed buying. But Defence Minister Anita Anand says the aircraft are better now than they were in the past. Since 2015, the aircraft has matured. And we see now that many of our allies, uh, eight countries in particular, are using the F-35. The 88 aircraft will cost Canada $19 billion. Earlier versions of the F-35 had a history of mechanical glitches. Canada's pilots will initially train with the new aircraft in the U.S. starting in 2026 until facilities are built here in Canada. Several members of the royal family have seen their approval ratings plunge as that highly anticipated memoir by Prince Harry arrives on bookstore shelves. A poll released today in the United Kingdom suggests King Charles' approval rating has dropped from 70 percent to 60 percent. Prince William's has fallen from 84 percent to 69 percent, and Harry himself now stands at a meager 26 percent approval rating. Harry is continuing his promotional campaign for the book. Last night he was on 60 Minutes in an interview with Anderson Cooper. You say you tried to do this privately. And every single time I've tried to do it privately, there have been briefings and leakings and planting of stories against me and my wife. Harry says he hopes the book will help the monarchy and spark press reforms in the United Kingdom. It contains many personal details, and Harry says he's hoping for a reconciliation with his brother, Prince William, and also with his father, the king. The book is due for release tomorrow. Some commentators say it has plunged the monarchy into its biggest crisis since the breakup of Charles' marriage to Princess Diana. The royal family is not commenting. More weather extremes are hitting California. As we took a, take a beautiful look at our own calm weather now, after the break, we'll look at the impact of those massive storms in California, and Fiona will bring her Manitoba forecast to us. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
California is bracing for more storms. Heavy rain is expected on ground there that's already at the saturation point. Iris Spitzer reports. California is preparing for more dangerous weather, even with the state still reeling from a series of storms over the past 10 days. Coastal communities in the Santa Cruz area and elsewhere are experiencing major flooding. The continuing rainfall is increasing the flood risk as rivers swell to dangerous levels. Meanwhile, mountain areas are seeing treacherous conditions due to heavy snowfall. At least 12 people have been killed so far in the series of storms. One homeless woman in Sacramento died as a result of a falling tree branch. A friend described his attempts to rescue her. My tree, tree part of my house there, it snapped off and, and landed on my neighbor's tent. I immediately went running down there and looked around for her and I started yelling for 911. Took open the side of the tent, pulled her out and uh, she was unresponsive. More than 100,000 Californians remain without power as strong winds have knocked down trees and power lines. California's Governor Gavin Newsom has asked for and received an emergency declaration from President Biden. The state is deploying around 160 members of the National Guard to help with search and rescue and other efforts. Several school districts canceled classes on Monday, and the severe weather is expected to continue for the next few days. Ira Spitzer for CBC News, Berkeley, California. Why is all that happening, Fiona? It's a really interesting phenomenon. So if we think back to what we were in December when we had all that cold air and the jet stream usually has a nice little wiggle to it and we had the polar vortex and the jet stream dipped and it brought that cold air. What's happening in California, which we don't see very often or at all, is the jet stream is a perfect line and it's headed right at the West Coast and it has brought this incredible incredibly unstable weather and it's unrelenting and that jet stream needs to get its wiggle on to give them a break but right now it is just you could put a ruler down on how straight it is it's just pummeling it over and over that is weird it's it's, it's wild but uh, I want to show you something really wild too here in the okay Paris, okay we're going to switch gears look at this amazing series of photos I have for you this was sent to us by Kevin he had a bucket list moment where he found not one, not two, but three stunning snowy owls. And you got to look at this one. Look, it's having a snooze. Kevin, thank you for sending these pictures in. They're incredible. All right, let's look at our current conditions. Minus eight right now in Selkirk. Minus seven in Steinbeck. Minus nine in Swan River. Barron's River, get ready, ready for some snow tonight. As we move further north, that's where all of our snow is going to be throughout that northern region. Fog is going to be a problem. Let's look at some of these numbers. Flin Flon, you're going to dip down. Melita, you're going to dip. Gimli into the eight uh, kilometers. That's still completely manageable. But just be prepared and know from this that we are going to see that fog rolling in, and that'll be an issue. Snow is also going to be a factor. Looking for several centimeters towards that Lynn Lake Thompson region and Norway House. Five centimeters to you. We're going to see very trace amounts of snow towards the southern portion of the province. Portage is really going to be the only zone that starts to register and piney with one centimeter. The wind will not be a huge issue for us. We do see it starting to increase as we look towards, say, Wednesday into Thursday. We see some wind gusts into the 30s, which is still relatively mild. Okay, let's take a look here. We're going to see in northwestern Ontario a very slight chance of some snow coming through. We're talking 30-40% chance of snow. Temperature still into those very unseasonable zone. We should be overnight minus 24. We are not there. We're going to see fog and possibly some light snow really around that south-southern portion. This is where we definitely see the snow with two centimeters coming towards the Paw and Norway House, two to four still continuing throughout the day tomorrow. Lots of fog in the morning, temperatures still incredibly mild throughout the Red River, Pemina Valley zones. So we have a really great day heading towards our Tuesday. Janet. Thank you so much, Fiona. You're welcome.
A Manitoba man is living out his childhood dream working with a Texas-based college football team. The story after the break. You're watching CBC News. NFL player DeMar Hamlin has been released from hospital in Cincinnati and transferred to Buffalo General Hospital, closer to friends and family. Hamlin plays for the Buffalo Bills. He collapsed during a game a week ago of cardiac arrest. The doctors say he's doing well and is beginning the next stage in his recovery. In recent days, Hamlin's walked and done physical and occupational therapy. During that road game against the Cincinnati Bengals last Monday, his heart stopped after a routine hit. He had to be resuscitated on the field. The game was initially postponed and then it was later canceled. A 37-year-old man from western Manitoba is living out a childhood dream. Barrett Dufour is a human performance intern with the Texas Christian University football team. They are playing in the national title game tonight against the Georgia Bulldogs, and he is right there. The CBC's Nathan Lewicki caught up with Barrett this afternoon. It's easily understandable. Duggan takes a knee, fitting that the football is in his hands as they march on to the championship game. 
Has it hit you that, that you're going to be on the sidelines of the, the college football playoffs national championship tonight? Um, not really. I don't think that's going to sink in for a little while. Um, fortunately, we've been in a couple of big games back to back. So we played the Big 12 championship um, at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium and we played the Fiesta Bowl at the Phoenix um, Cardinal Stadium. So as far as being in NFL stadiums on big stages, um, fortunately, like we, we've had the experience of that and it's uh, nothing new to me. But um, the idea of the national championship and everything that that has um, that goes along with that is probably going to take a while for it to really sink in. Is it just surreal for you to, to know of your upbringing and, and all you've gone through? You went to, to Europe to study, to play rugby, and, and now you're, you're, you're essentially, you're here. Uh, it is and it is. And I mean, as far as like, when you talk about the difference between processes and outcomes, the process has always sort of been uh, find ways to get better, find ways to improve and uh, find new opportunities and taking a lot of risks. Um, so I think on that end, I definitely, you know, held up my end of the bargain of finding ways to get better and, um, you know, taking the most of opportunities. But um, if you kind of look at the season about how I kind of wound up at TCU and the kind of run that the um, team had, there's definitely a lot of a lot of magic going on. There's definitely something special that um, is going on with this team right now. So to be part of that is definitely a blessing, and I'm definitely very fortunate to be here. And you were only supposed to be in Fort Worth for a couple of months. Can, can you explain how that uh, that position that you're currently in kind of got extended? Um, yeah, so I was, uh, the length of the internship was only for the summer, but um, towards the end of the summer, they asked me to stay on a little bit later. Um, so uh, I just kind of went down for the experience and they wanted me to stay, um, do fall camp, do the season. Um, I was hired at another university at the start of the season um, but my uh, paperwork didn't go through for the work visa, so I came back to Fort Worth. And um, so I would miss the first three games of the season. And at the time, we weren't ranked or anything. Um, we'd played Colorado, uh, done a tune-up game with Carleton and just beat SMU. So um, when I came back the second time, I just kind of wanted to see what a college football game was like. And um, I wanted to coach these kids because I'd spent the summer with the kids and I built relationships with the kids and things like that. Um, and then we just kind of went on a run. So, um, yeah, we just we're on this, I guess, magic carpet ride and um, tonight's the grand finale. Can you give me a kind of a quick synopsis of, of what your role is uh, with the Horn Frogs? I know you're a human performance intern, but can you simplify it for the, for the people at home? Uh, yeah, so basically any branch uh, that goes into human performance, I assist the full-time staff with. Um, so a real basic overview, we deal with performance nutrition, we deal with strength and conditioning, we deal with applied sports science uh, and sports psychology. Um, so in, in the day-to-day -day with that, uh, me and the other interns just sort of have different uh, roles and tasks um, that sort of smooth things out for the full-timers so that they can get the job done um, and make our players better for Saturday. And is there any butterflies um, heading into tonight for you, knowing that you do have you know uh, a role in the game? You're not just there as someone who's setting up GPS trackers on shoulder pads or uh, trying to measure how much Gatorade and water these, these guys should be intaking uh, after every time they're on the field? Uh, no, fortunately, um, uh, we do a pretty good job of being able to go to the facility beforehand. So we get to see the stadium and uh, see the paint and, and sort of see all those things. Um, I also know a little bit about sports psychology. So, uh, you know, I can kind of keep myself in the zone and uh, keep my thought patterns in the right place and things like that. Um, but yeah, walking out of the tunnel with the smoke and the fire and, and the national anthem and the kickoff and all that stuff, you're uh, maybe lying if you didn't say it got your toes tapping. So um, there will be a minute or two there at the start of the game where, you know, it'll be a pretty big rush and we'll have to settle in and just get back down to business. So right now I'm okay, but th there'll be once, once the national anthem is over, there's always those butterflies. So. Well, I think that's that's everything, Barrett. I again, I appreciate your time. Have a blast tonight. Enjoy it. Take it all in. Right on, Nathan. I appreciate you uh, taking the time, and thank you very much. Your seven-day forecast and daily lift are still ahead. You're watching CBC Winnipeg News.
Looking for a cloudy evening here in Winnipeg. We're also looking for a very small chance of snow this evening. And that'll be really lingering into tomorrow. But what you're going to be seeing for the next several days is lots of cloud cover. Temperatures still well above the 30-year average. But uh, put your sunglasses away because, well, you just don't need them. <laughs> I'm dancing because I don't like cold weather. This, you're, this is apparently this a dance. This is the Janet dance. <laughs> Well, the International Ice and Snow Festival is now underway in Harbin, China. Now, apparently, that is the capital of the country's northernmost province, and that is where we find tonight's Daily Lift. Wow, is that beautiful. This festival includes ice sculptures, sculpting contests, winter sports, parades, other celebrations. Okay, looks a little bit like Festival or something we'd see here. We just know those lights, That's right? That's incredible. Dozens of teams have created ice sculptures. One of the most popular exhibits is a giant snow sculpture of a rabbit. We just saw that. Look from above. That's what we need. We need okay, that. Festival. We need crazy LED lights <laughs> and lots of drones. Yeah, that is like Festival times 100. Yeah, we can do that, Yeah, right? We, we can, yeah, we, we got, got what, a month. That. Okay, after we work, can do we'll that. do it. Thank you for being with us. Have a great night, everyone. Good night.